and welcome to episode six of the Liberty Lounge. I'm your host, Jordan Alexander Hill, and today I have something a little bit special for you listeners. As you know, um, the Liberty Lounge is a segment where we examine the great ideas um, of the Western canon, specifically as it relates to the theme of liberty, right? Freedom. Um, so far on the Liberty Lounge, um, we've uh, explored Thomas G. West's book, The Political Theory of the American Founding. We did two episodes on that. We also um, have had on Kevin Gutsman, and we explored um, his book on Jefferson. We did an episode on Jonah Goldberg's book, The Suicide of the West, and then um, uh, we even had Jonah Goldberg on. We've had Thomas E. Woods Jr. on the podcast as well uh, for an episode of the Liberty Lounge. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. I have a special treat for you listeners. I just so happen to have published a piece for Quillette Magazine, uh, a long-form think piece on the topic of the libertarian history of science fiction. So I happen to know that a, a lot of my listeners are science fiction fans, and so I thought this would be kind of of general interest. I also think for a lot of people who are kind of non-political or not really uh, that concerned with issues of liberty, might find um, the history of science fiction as an interesting um, foray into the topic of liberty as an interesting kind of introduction um, to certain ideas of liberty. This way, those ideas are kind of connected to works of science fiction that listeners may be interested in. So without further ado, um, what we're going to do is I will I will kind of narrate my piece. Um, I'll do a, a sort of read aloud of my piece. Hopefully that you enjoy that. And then when I'm finished uh, reading the piece aloud, I will play an interview that I did uh, for ABC RN in Australia uh, for the Amanda Vanstone show. Um, they got wind of my essay. Um, the host, Amanda Vanstone, who is very popular in uh, Australia, does a very popular radio show there. She thought that the article was fascinating and wanted to learn more about it uh, by speaking with the author. And so without further ado, um, here it is, The Libertarian History of Science Fiction by yours truly, Jordan Alexander Hill. When mainstream authors like Eric Flint complain that the science fiction establishment and its gatekeeper, the Hugo Awards, has drifted away from the opinions and tastes of mass audiences prioritizing progressive messaging over plot development, the response from the left is uniform. Science fiction is by its very nature progressive. It's baked into the cake, they say. This is a superficially plausible claim. With its focus on the future, its embrace of the unfamiliar and otherworldly, and its openness to alternative ways of living, it's hard to see how the genre could be anything but progressive. In fact, studies indicate that interest in sci-fi books and movies is strongly correlated with a big five personality trait called openness to experience, which psychologists say is highly predictive of liberal values. But openness to experience also correlates with libertarianism. And libertarian themes and ideas have exercised far greater influence than progressivism over sci-fi since the genre's inception. From conservatarian voices like Robert Heinlein, Larry Niven, Werner Vinge, Poole Anderson, and F. Paul Wilson, to those of a more flexible, classical liberal bent like Ray Bradbury, David Brin, Charles Strauss, Ken McLeod, and Terry Pratchett, Libertarian-leaning authors have had an outsized, lasting influence on the field. So much so that the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction has deemed libertarian sci-fi its own standalone branch, admitting that many of libertarianism's most influential texts have been by sci-fi writers. So, is the connection between sci-fi and the liberty movement necessary? Or is it contingent? While most science fiction novels are not libertarian, all the best-known libertarian novels, says Jeff Riggenbach, are science fiction novels, from Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged to Neal Stephenson's Cryptonomicon. Even among conservatives, Stevenson himself writes, it is the ostracized libertarian wing, the wing still able to hold up one end of a Socratic dialogue that has disproportionately high representation among fans of speculative fiction. Libertarians even have their own sci-fi literature awards. 
Each year, the Prometheus and Prometheus Hall of Fame Awards are given out by the Libertarian Futurist Society, a tradition dating back to the 1970s. Instead of a trophy, winners are given a one-ounce gold coin representing free trade and free minds. There's also a prominent publishing house, Bain Books, that prioritizes liberty-themed sci-fi literature. Though its authors and editors are ideologically diverse, ranging, says author Larry Correa, from libertarian to communist, Bain nevertheless represents an impressive cohort of staunch liberty defenders, among them Correa himself, Sarah Hoyt, and Michael Z. Williamson. Although Bain has attempted to distance itself from political affiliation, the company frequently publishes liberty-themed tracts and anthologies, including the recent Taxpayers' Tea Party, a manual for reclaiming our country, by Sharon Cooper and Chuck Assay. Science Fiction's Libertarian Roots Although some critics trace sci-fi's roots all the way back to Homer's Odyssey, Plato's Republic, or, as Nabokov once argued, Shakespeare's The Tempest, most scholars agree that the genre as we know it began with the publication of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which many libertarians understand to be a cautionary tale about what happens when power-seeking men, under the guise of progress, devise a Promethean monster, the state, that takes on an uncontrollable life of its own. Whether Shelley, whose parents were the libertarian feminist Mary Wollstonecraft and the father of modern anarchism William Godwin, intended this reading or not, is unknown. Nevertheless, Michaela Novak argues that the story remains a libertarian favorite for the ways in which Mary Shelley grapples with matters of individuality, free will, and moral choices, and the place of individuals situated within broader civil society. Still, it's difficult to have science fiction in the modern sense until you have science in the modern sense. While the works of Shelley, Jules Verne, and H.G. Wells were successful examples of proto-sci-fi, it was the rise of the pulps in the 1930s that finally made it possible to make a living writing consistently in the genre. Magazine sci-fi, with its swoopy chrome ships and bubble-suited spacemen, grew initially out of publications like Amazing Stories, founded by Hugo Gernsback of the eponymous Hugo Awards in 1926. But it wasn't until 1938, when John W. Campbell took editorial control over Astounding Magazine, that the field began to properly develop its libertarian strain, a consequence of what sci-fi historians call the Campbellian Revolution. Today, Campbell is considered the most powerful editor in the history of sci-fi, says Professor Michael D.C. Drought of Wheaton College. With a strident editorial hand, he ushered in the golden age of science fiction and shaped the work of greats like Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, and Lester Del Rey, among many others. Campbell's ideas sometimes veered into Nietzschean Superman territory, and he was often taken in by pseudoscientific humbug like extrasensory perception and telepathy, a weakness exacerbated by his friendship with L. Ron Hubbard. But he was, all things considered, a cheerleader for freedom in the American way. With Campbell at the helm, a new ethos came to define the industry. A tradition, writes Eric S. Raymond, of ornery and insistent individualism, veneration of the competent man, an instinctive distrust of coercive social engineering, and a rock-ribbed empiricism that valued knowing how things work. In short, the new hard sci-fi emphasized a spirit of self-reliance and libertarian preparedness that saw heroic individuals rather than government as the key to solving humanity's future problems. The attitude of rugged American individualism that defined the pulps grew, in part, out of a sense of loss. By the 1930s, the last frontiers of Earth had been explored or mapped, creating a yearning for new vistas. As history closed off the real frontiers, sci-fi created new ones. The spirit of the pulps can also be seen as a reaction against the rising tide of collectivism. Communism and fascism were sweeping through Europe, and FDR's New Deal policies were increasing the size and scope of government at home. An intellectual elite in a far distant capital, as Reagan would later put it, was promising to cure the ails of Americans and plan their lives for them. It made sense then that many of the period's big names were problem solvers with backgrounds in science or engineering, including Campbell, who held a bachelor's in physics from Duke, along with his protege, Robert A. Heinlein, an aeronautical engineer who would become one of the genre's greatest talents. Mm -hmm. 
Heinlein and the Competent Man. Quote, I have learned this about engineers. When something must be done, engineers can find a way. Turn your engineers loose. Robert A. Heinlein, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Campbell's preference for realistic, logically rigorous storytelling allowed him to, quote, turn his engineer loose. Under Campbell's editorship, Heinlein and other writers introduced the reading public to a new type of protagonist, the competent man, a rugged, technically skilled, polymathic figure who was just as comfortable fixing his spaceship as he was defending himself with a ray gun. In a post-war age of atomic uncertainty and space exploration, jack-of-all-trades survivalists made for excellent heroes. In his novel Time Enough for Love, Heinlein describes the competent man as follows. A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. The culture that Campbell and other Golden Age authors created was one of techno-optimism and a confidence that reason and human ingenuity would save the day. One of science fiction's central assumptions, writes Alec Novella Lee in his book Astounding, was that the skills it developed in its writers and readers would prepare them for an unknown future. Sci-fi's faith that rational individuals can solve their own problems and plan their own lives, its belief that science and innovation can liberate humanity from the slings and arrows of an unnecessary status quo, these are the qualities that set the genre at odds with both progressive and conservative ideologies. They are also the qualities that have enthralled many libertarian fans. Thanks to writers like Heinlein, sci-fi has produced its share of converts, too. According to Jeff Regenbach, in a survey conducted by the Society for Individual Liberty in the 1970s, quote, one libertarian activist in six had been led to libertarianism by reading the novels and short stories of Robert A. Heinlein. Dave Nolan, a founder of the Libertarian Party, was one such activist. Nolan was so influenced by Heinlein, says Brian Doherty in Radicals for Capitalism, that he wore a Heinlein for President button during the 1960 campaign. Although he began his career as a utopian socialist working for Upton Sinclair's 1934 gubernatorial campaign, Heinlein underwent a political transformation and became known for the rest of his career as a libertarian guru of sorts. Scott Timberg at the LA Times describes him as a nudist with a military hardware fetish who dominated the pulps and became the first science fictionist to land on the New York Times bestseller list. A four-time Hugo Award winner, Heinlein is credited with helping to elevate sci-fi from its ray blaster and tentacled space monster phase to a more serious, respectable prominence, penning such classics as Stranger in a Strangeland and Milton Friedman's favorite, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, a book that reads like an anarcho-capitalist blueprint for revolutionary uprising. Friedman even named his 1975 public policy book after the novel's slogan, Tonstoffel, There Ain't No Such Thing as a Free Lunch. There have been attempts to downplay Heinlein's commitment to liberty and to label him a fascist, a spurious mischaracterization of his worldview that arose after the publication of his 1959 novel Starship Troopers, a story set in a quasi-fascistic society. But Heinlein loathed authoritarianism and resented such accusations. To call Heinlein a fascist, argues Adam Roberts in The History of Science Fiction, quite misrepresents his particular brand of ideological reaction. Whilst always a patriotic American, Heinlein was ideologically invested neither in racial nor geographical ideals. His books preach a libertarian gospel. Heinlein said as much in a letter describing his outlook, writing, As for libertarian, I've been one all my life, a radical one. You might use the term philosophical anarchist or autarchist about me, but libertarian is easier to define and fits well enough. The New Wave
By the 1960s, a group of brash young writers emerged, loosely associated with Michael Moorcock's magazine New Worlds. This group included J.G. Ballard, Samuel Delaney, Brian Aldiss, and Joanna Roos, and they began to call foul on the old guard of science fiction. Armed with an avant-garde sensibility, the radical new wave inspired by the Frankfurt School and critical theory challenged the dogmas of the Golden Age and changed the face of sci-fi forever. At least, that's the story critical histories of the genre now tell. But this is a crude revisionist narrative born of the impulse to neatly periodize literary history. The truth is less schismatic. In retrospect, says critic Damien Broderick, it is more accurate to describe the intellectual fecundity of the new wave, a moniker borrowed from French cinema, as a, quote, reaction against genre exhaustion. More than anything, the movement can be seen as a bid on the part of talents like Ursula Le Guin and Thomas M. Dish to bring a much-needed thoughtfulness and literary credibility to the field. There was also an attempt to turn the genre inward, to explore, quote, inner space, consciousness, psychological states, and perception, rather than outer space. While some New Wave writers were political leftists who wished to dismantle the genre's Campbellian trappings, for the most part, sci-fi's school of resentment, to use the Bloomian pejorative, was a sequestered, insular phenomenon. Instead, the proliferation of fresh voices and renewed focus on stylistic experimentation worked to lift all boats. Like Dadaism and Surrealism, the New Wave had more to do with liberation from bourgeois artistic constraints than any political agenda. The new wave, says Adam Roberts, called for a more passionate, subtle, ironic, and original form of sci-fi. But the result was that it wound up bringing together the literary sensibilities associated with high modernism and the energies of popular pulp sci-fi. The upshot was a new type of sci-fi, entertaining and rigorous, but at the same time thoughtful and stylistically sophisticated. It was the progeny of this union, in works like Stanislaw Lem's Solaris, 1961, Heinlein's Stranger in a Strangeland, 1961, Frank Herbert's Dune, 1965, Philip K. Dick's Ubik, 1969, Paul Anderson's Tau Zero, 1970, and Le Guin's The Dispossessed, 1974, that would define sci-fi of the 60s and 70s and go on to become enduring classics. The heady, rebellious atmosphere of this period produced some of the best libertarian sci-fi ever written. In Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron, 1961, one man fights back against a dystopian regime that enforces rigid equality of outcome through handicaps that stifle excellence. In Eric Frank Russell's The Great Explosion, 1962, militarists from Earth visit an isolated colony and meet a peaceful libertarian society whose people call themselves Gans, after Gandhi. In Poole Anderson's No Truce with Kings, 1963, aliens come to a post-apocalyptic Earth to, quote, help the backwards natives resolve their feuds, but the mission goes awry. In Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, 1966, a lunar colony rebels against Earth's oppressive control and a struggle for independence mirroring the American Revolution. In Jack Vance's Empirio, 1969, the people of Halma, inspired by a legendary hero, lead a revolt against the planet's overlords who have outlawed free trade. In Ira Levin's This Perfect Day, 1970, every aspect of life is planned by a world government run by a central computer called Uni, that is, until a group rises up. In Shea and Wilson's The Illuminatus Trilogy, 1975, readers meet libertarian characters as they're drawn into a surreal, hallucinatory web of conspiracy theories related to the global Illuminati and its control of world governments. Other favorites from the era include Niven and Pornell's Lucifer's Hammer, 1977, and F. Paul Wilson's Wheels Within Wheels, 1978. Golden Age Redux By the early 1980s, writers like Kingsley Ami were declaring the new wave officially over and celebrating a Golden Age revival. It's more accurate to say, though, as Adam Roberts does, that the Golden Age never went away. 
Campbellian era writers like Heinlein, Clark, and Asimov, the big three as they became known, captured numerous Hugo and Nebula awards throughout the 1960s and 70s, and their works flew off bookstore shelves well into the 1980s and 90s. Alongside these pulp era pros, a generation of worthy inheritors was assuming the mantle. It was this new talent, together with the success of the Star Wars franchise, that would create a new thirst for hard sci-fi adventure stories and a boom in commercial sci-fi publishing. But the Campbellian Renaissance was different this time around. A more overt, principled libertarian strain was emerging in prolific writers like Werner Vinge, Larry Niven, Gregory Benford, a longtime contributing editor for Reason Magazine, Victor Milan, F. Paul Wilson, and L. Neil Smith. The works of Ayn Rand, which frequently drifted into the realm of sci-fi and inspired a wave toward deregulation in the 1980s, had never been more popular. The Libertarian Party had grown rapidly since its founding in 1971 and had achieved ballot access in all 50 states by 1980. The economists Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman had recently won Nobel Prizes. The Liberty Movement was thriving. That the sci-fi of this period often advanced a conservative view of liberty had to do with the political zeitgeist of the time, the ascendancy of Ronald Reagan's big defense limited government ethos in the U.S. and Margaret Thatcher's free market conservatism in the U.K. It was, however, Reagan's reputation as a cold warrior and his enthusiasm for the strategic defense initiative, Star Wars as critics mockingly called it, that captured the imaginations of right-leaning libertarian authors. The idea behind SDI, to install a network of orbiting battle stations that could serve as a nuclear deterrent and shoot down intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, using lasers, was like something out of a space opera novel. A huge fan of the day the Earth stood still in its anti-nuclear war rhetoric, writes Kevin Bankston, Reagan grew up devouring fantastic sci-fi tales like Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter of Mars stories. It was not surprising, then, that Reagan's Citizen Advisory Council on National Space Policy was made up of some of the greatest sci-fi talent of the 20th century. In addition to astronauts, scientists, engineers, and, and Reagan's advisor, Lieutenant General Daniel O. Graham, the council included authors Larry Niven, Jerry Pornell, Jim Bain of Bain Books, Robert Heinlein, and Poole Anderson. According to Pornell, Reagan's 1983 speech announcing SDI to the public was based on the technical plans, arguments, and phrases the council had drawn up for the president. The free market energy of the 1980s and collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s reinstated a shared consensus regarding the value of freedom and limited government. Yet, it will be a mistake to see libertarian sci-fi as an intellectual monoculture. Then and now, the subgenre has been a spectrum. At one extreme, writes Eric S. Raymond, you have fiction such as that of L. Neil Smith, which reads like radical libertarian propaganda. At the other extreme, you have what could fairly be described as conservative militarist power fantasies and the writing of Jerry Pornell and David Drake. The finest work, like that of Heinlein, tends to fall somewhere in the wide, heterodox middle. The Necessary Connection It is 2020, and though socialism is again in vogue, 44% of millennials say they'd prefer to live in a socialist country, libertarian sci-fi is showing no signs of waning. The connection between sci-fi and liberty is not simply an accidental byproduct of the colorful history of sci-fi publishing, but a necessary one tied to certain fundamentals of the genre. The soil of speculative fiction, in other words, has the right nutrients for the flourishing of libertarian values. But what are they? Unlike most ideologies that advocate forms of protectionism and Luddite restrictionism, the libertarian outlook values choice, freedom, and market solutions. Libertarians, writes Ilya Soman for the Prometheus Newsletter, are more likely to welcome such technological advances as genetic engineering, cloning, and nuclear power. The genre as a whole also tends towards technological optimism. Another element, certainly, is a general openness to radical new ideas and an instinctive rejection of stale convention and custom. This trait unites libertarians and progressives against Burkean conservatives. 
Openness to novelty and diversity enables sci-fi writers to speculate, hence the name speculative fiction, and go where other writers bound by earthly limitations cannot. Sci-fi, writes Pittsburgh University professor Elisa Bashero Bondar, is the genre that considers what strange new beings we might become, what mechanical forms we might invent for our bodies, what networks and systems might nourish or tap our life energies, and what machine shells might contain our souls. At the same time, sci-fi stands firm against the collectivist notions of both progressives and common good conservatives. The individual is foolish, wrote Edmund Burke, but the species is wise. In sci-fi, the inverse is true. The species or collective is often coercive, irrational, and destructive. In The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, Heinlein offers us a warning about left and right collectivism delivered by the character of Professor De La Paz, a rational anarchist who urges, distrust the obvious, suspect the traditional, for in the past mankind has not done well when saddling itself with governments. Do not let the past be a straitjacket. Perhaps this is why so much of sci-fi expresses itself as dystopian fiction, a genre which by its very nature cannot but take on a libertarian flavor. Totalitarianism, war, and wide-scale oppression is almost always carried out by state force. Liberation, accordingly, must come in the form of negative rights, that is, freedom from, and voluntarism. In writing your constitution, Professor De La Paz instructs, let me invite attention to the wonderful virtues of the negative. Accentuate the negative. Let your document be studded with things the government is forever forbidden to do. There are some exceptions. In cyberpunk novels like Stevenson's Snow Crash or M.T. Anderson's Feed, dystopian misery is often a result of corporate control or not enough government. But even these works make libertarian arguments. In the case of Snow Crash, the minimal state fails to carry out its only moral duty from a Lockean perspective, to protect citizens' natural rights. In Feed, corporations run every aspect of life thanks to cronyism, corruption, and regulatory capture, all libertarian bugaboos. Which brings us to a final reason that libertarian authors choose to express their ideas through a science fictional lens. While dystopias satirize and allegorize the flawed political systems and social practices that govern the world we know, sci-fi is more often about exploring new worlds and systems. Contrary to traditional literary fiction, which is mostly set in the present-day world or in the historical past, writes Soman, science fiction makes it easier for authors to explore ideologies, like libertarianism, that differ radically from those dominant in the real world. Ideologies that, unlike socialism, have truly never been tried. Okay, so thank you so much for listening uh, to that article. I had a lot of fun writing it. I got lots of feedback. The Heinlein Society uh, contacted me. The John Locke um, Society or whatever it's called, the the John Locke Foundation or something like that contacted me. Um, they, uh, the, the guy that runs that uh, read the article and he really liked it. Only negative feedback I got was from an angry science fiction writer um, who thought it was unfair that I, uh, that I characterized him as having a flexible classical liberal bent. Apparently he's a little uh, further left than that. Um, uh, but, you know, my publishers did not want to make a correction because there's there's so much evidence uh, in this guy's writing that points to the fact that his, that his, that his um, sci-fi novels have so many libertarian themes and ideas in them. I mean, the guy won a Prometheus Award. The guy literally writes uh, for a living about cryptocurrencies. And um, uh, so there really wasn't anything to correct there. Um, I said that his work, uh, that his his voice as an author displayed a classical liberal um, uh, bent or was libertarian leaning. Um, so I, I tried to hedge um, uh, my words and be really careful about how I described people. But still, uh, this guy um, who's, whose name is... Um, 
whose name is Charles Strauss, basically flipped out on Twitter and had a little hissy fit over it. But that's okay. That's okay. He had nothing nice to say, but um, I did hear from a lot of a lot of other people who really appreciated the the article, and um, I had a lot of fun writing it. And, um, and now I would like to play you my interview. Okay, with Amanda Vanstone uh, for the ABCRN program, The Amanda Vanstone Show. She read the article, thought it was fascinating, and uh, we did a little interview. And here's what it sounded like. This is an ABC podcast. Hi, I'm Amanda Vanstone. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me. The liberal world order depends on some shared rules. If we all want to go our own way, something akin to anarchy on a national scale, it might look ugly globally. We want to control ourselves, but we want to be part of the world team. It's tricky. Space was once elusive, but now it's in our grasp. There's plenty on offer and we are right in there. Science fiction is not a reading genre that you might readily associate with politics, but it's very liberal, down with evil autocrats and up with personal freedom. This is an ABC podcast. Oh, that's strange music, isn't it? It's the theme from Forbidden Planet. Now, why do we play that? Well, science fiction is a genre that's really important. And you know what? It champions liberalism. That's right. Down with autocrats, down with dictators, down with big government telling you what to do. You, the individual, the hero. You're the one not read it. Can seem like stupid stories that little boys read. You know, I think of the Flintstones and cartoons and things like that. But of course, I'm completely ignorant in this area because I don't read science fiction. But I recently read something about it and mine eyes have been opened. Absolutely. And if you think about it, the heroes in science fiction are nothing like the progressives today. Nothing. They're much more libertarian. Joining me now to discuss... This issue is Jordan Hill. He happens to be a high school English and philosophy teacher in Massachusetts, but he's an independent author and the host of a podcast called The Western Canon. Jordan Hill, welcome to Counterpoint. Thank you very much, Amanda. Jordan Hill, what made you decide to write an article entitled The Libertarian History of Science Fiction? Well, I am a high school English and philosophy teacher, as you mentioned, and I actually teach a course called From Wizards to Wormholes, Introduction to Fantasy and Sci-Fi Literature. And as I was putting together the curriculum for that course, I was noticing that, as you pointed out, the heroes in science fiction, especially early science fiction, were of a different character. The influential editor, John W. Campbell, called that the competent man. So... This is the idea of, you know, exploring new frontiers a la, you know, Star Trek and being able to have the competencies and skills to survive, right? A kind of libertarian preparedness to deal with whatever you're faced with, right? And so I'm reading all of these pieces and I'm also noticing as I type into Wikipedia names like Robert Heinlein and Werner Vinge and L. Neil Smith, I'm learning that these guys are libertarians. And then I'm digging into older works like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is considered the sort of central proto-science fiction novel. And even Mary Shelley is the daughter of what one libertarian outlet called the father of modern anarchism, William Godwin. And of course, Mary Wollstonecraft is famous for her advocacy of natural rights and libertarian ideas. And so uh, as I read... Mm. Yes, yes. So as I read into it, I realized that even the left-wing progressive authors of sci-fi had this kind of rugged spirit of individualism and liberty. And if you look at works of dystopian literature, the central elements of those novels are 
you know, speaking out against fascism and communism and authoritarian tendencies. They're kind of anti-statist novels, novels like Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Bradbury was a conservative. Huxley's Brave New World. And of course, in Brave New World, the villains are named, you know, Marx and Lenin and things like that. And then, of course, there are peaks and valleys of libertarianism cutting all the way through the history of science fiction and into the present day. And so that really impressed me. Yeah. Well, you mentioned this guy, John Campbell, who is described by many, including yourself, as one of the greatest editors of science fiction. And a description someone gave of him was, and I'm quoting from your article, but you're quoting someone else, of ornery and insistent individualism, veneration of the competent man and instinctive distrust of coercive social engineering and a rock-ribbed empiricism that valued knowing how things work. Well, he sounds like a great guy. (laughs) <laughs> he wasn't perfect. He had some odd sort of Nietzschean 19th century Superman beliefs. And the thing is, is he was very good friends with and an editor of L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology. And so um, the thing about Campbell was that he was always changing his beliefs and he was a very open minded fellow. He was taken by things like, you know, ESP and he had some odd mm-hmm. beliefs. But he was a scientist. He had his training from Duke, I believe it was, and MIT. And Campbell really brought to science fiction his patriotism. That was something that he always kept, his love of freedom in the American way. And also his belief in scientific rigor. He believed that science fiction could pave the way for science in the future. And that's, in fact, exactly what it did. There's even a documentary series out now. I think the director is Ridley Scott. And it's all about how science fiction authors really are driving science rather than the other way around, imagining and dreaming up what could be possible in the future. And then, of course, uh, it's not possible at the time, but scientists and researchers chase the tales and gain inspiration from science fiction authors. Mm. You mentioned driving the future. One of the comments in the article is that science fiction developed in part because of the closing of the frontiers, and that is we'd explored them on Earth, and so we were looking for other things. But in terms of driving policy, I had not a clue that Reagan, with his strategic defence initiative, involved science fiction writers. Tell us that story, because it's a great story. Yeah, it's a really interesting one, and it has a lot to do with the fact that Reagan was interested in science fiction himself. He grew up reading science fiction, the John Carter of Mars stories. He liked science fiction films. He was an actor himself. And so Reagan, being an actor, had this dramatic sense of what was possible. And so, of course, when he decided to launch his SDI program, the Strategic Defense Initiative, to the public, he made sure that on his Citizen Advisory Council on National Space Policy, there would be many creative sci-fi talents sitting on that council were authors like Larry Niven, Jerry Pornell, Jim Bain, who started the company Bain Books, Robert Heinlein, who is probably the most influential science fiction author in history, Poole Anderson, and many others. Gregory Benford was also on that. Many of these guys were libertarians, right? And so this team of science fiction authors actually drew up the plans, included phrases that Reagan used when he actually announced it to the public in 1983. So for listeners who don't know, SEI was In the Cold War, Reagan wanted this uh, network of satellites that would be able to, you know, shoot down ICBMs. And he thought that this would be a good way of not starting a nuclear war, but also being able to defend the United States. And it was very science fiction. The idea of uh, manned or unmanned battle stations orbiting the Earth and shooting lasers, shooting intercontinental ballistic missiles out of the sky was something out of space opera or some kind of just far-fetched science fiction novel. But of course, Reagan grew up on these science fiction stories and he was reading people like Heinlein. And so he recruited these guys, along with his own advisor, Daniel O. Graham, and some astronauts and scientists to be on this council and to actually drive the policy. Many of the phrases that Reagan uses when he's giving his speech about it are drawn up by the the science fiction writers. And so I think it really speaks to both the atmosphere of the time. If you remember the 1980s, you know, Ayn Rand was extremely popular. There was a sort of limited government 
revolution, a kind of American conservatism, big defense, limited government. The Libertarian Party had recently been founded and was growing. Hayek and Friedman were winning Nobel Prizes. So there was a kind of political zeitgeist of the time, and science fiction was booming in the 1980s. There was a golden age revival in sci-fi. And so, yeah, at that time, the public was listening to science fiction authors, many of whom had backgrounds in science, and all of that kind of came together to produce something really unlikely. You're on RN. This is Counterpoint. I'm Amanda Vanstone. I'm talking with Jordan Hill. He's the host of a podcast called The Western Canon, but he's also a high school English and philosophy teacher in Massachusetts, and we're talking about science fiction. All those libertarians, progressives, (laughs) forget it. I don't know much about this Robert Heinlein, but you do quote him in the article you've written. (laughs) And he seems to be a very, like, new age trendy bloke because he says, and I'm quoting, a human being, that includes men, a human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyse a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. End of quote. Specialisation is for insects. I mean, this guy is fabulous. He agrees that men should be able to change diapers. Yes. (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, look, I agree with the attraction of the competent man, but I think he's gone a bit far there, don't you? I do think men should be able to change diapers, but I don't know if she'd be able to do all of those things. Might be going a bit far. Do you agree? Well, I think Heinlein was responding to, and of course he relied on this trope more and more, that definition that Heinlein gave of the competent man comes from one of his yeah. last novels. I think that Heinlein was seeing a trend toward, and you see this now, people can't even read a map anymore, right? We have all of these gadgets that guide our lives, right? And we're increasingly spending our time specializing, focusing on one thing. Heinlein wanted to kind of prioritize this idea of a competent man, originally man, and then of course as sci-fi becomes more diverse, it becomes men and women. But Heinlein thought that human beings should be able to survive. And of course he's a sci-fi writer, and so his novels take place in outer space. If your spaceship breaks down in the middle of nowhere, you either oh, cool. fix your ship or you die, right? And of course, like Odysseus sailing the wine dark seas trying to get home, the space explorer also needs to have a sophisticated compass, also needs to have engineering tools. Think about what is required of NASA astronauts when we send them in space. They need to be good at math. They need to be able to stay up for long hours. They need to have analytical tools. They need to be able to use physical tools, right? They need to be able to act spontaneously and save the day. And so Heinlein was fascinated by the figure of the competent man, someone who could save the day using his or her brain, right? And of course, that's what libertarians are all about is using reason. It's about the individual using reason to solve problems in their own life and to make their own way in the world without aid from above. Government telling them what to do, yeah. Well, most sci-fi novels, if you can put that generalisation on it, but there's a lot of sci-fi novels complain about government taking over, you know, people fighting against the system that wants to control everybody. There's a few that go the other way, I understand. Yeah. But this Highland guy started off as a utopian socialist but ended up a libertarian. But who knew and how did you find out that Milton Friedman, the revered economist by many, was a fan of his and in particular his book The Moon is a Harsh Mistress? How did you find that out? <laughs> well, I was teaching The Moon is a Harsh Mistress for my fantasy and sci-fi course And that book is about a lunar colony, right? Kind of like the early New South Wales. (laughs) The moon was a lunar prison colony. And eventually those prisoners had children and families and eventually no longer was a prison colony anymore. And so this colony in The Moon is a Harsh Mistress is controlled by Earth. And so you have big government Earth controlling how people earn a living, planning citizens' lives for them, imposing arduous, coercive laws and rules on the citizens. And the book is sort of American revolutionary style, sort of anarcho-capitalist uprising against the tyrannical Terrans or Earthers, you know. And so it's just loaded with libertarian philosophy and the character of Professor Bernardo de la Paz, 
And so I'm sitting there reading this book and, of course, reading the slogan, Tonstoffel, which is, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And I also happen to be a libertarian myself and was you know, watching Milton Friedman's public lectures, and he would often mention Tan Stoffel. And so, of course, I look into it, and he's even named his 1975 public policy book after the novel's slogan, There Ain't No Such Thing as a Free Lunch. And of course, this was an older slogan. Heinlein didn't invent it, but it's just the idea that it's impossible to get something for nothing. Even when the government gives you something that's free, it's not actually free. And you know, it's just kind of a concept that describes opportunity costs, right? That for every mm. choice that you make, there's an alternative that you're not choosing. And it's just the idea that decision making requires trade offs and it assumes there are no free offerings in society that we have to work for the fruits. Fair enough. Jordan Hill, you have opened a window in my brain and let some fresh air in. And that is a pleasure. It's always nice to talk to someone or read a book that adds to the stock of knowledge you've got. But when fresh air comes in and you start a new stock, a new subject, it's a great pleasure. Thanks very much for joining us. No problem. And thank you for reading the article. Well, that's it for the program this week. Thanks for joining me. As you know, if you've got something to say, just go to the ABC site, go to RN and follow the prompts to Counterpoint. By the way, the lumberjack recipe, it's on my agenda. I'm going to make it next week and give it a run. Anyway, keep your comments, good and bad, coming in. We welcome them. Until next week, it's Amanda Vanstone saying Arrivederci. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.